Ananda said to the Buddha, World honored one, I also have heard the Buddha discussed true appearance with Manjushri and the other disciples of the Dharma king. The world honored one also said the mind is not inside and it is not outside. As now consider it, if it were within, it would see things it does not see. If it were outside, there would be no common perception. Since it cannot see inside, it cannot be inside. And since the body and mind have common perception, it does not make sense to say it is outside. Therefore, since there is a common perception and since there is no seeing within, it must be in the middle. The Buddha said, you say it is in the middle, that middle must not be haphazard or without a fixed location. Where is this middle that you propose? Is it in an external place or is it in the body? If it were in the body, it could not be on the surface of the body since that is not the middle. But to be in the middle is no different than being inside. If it were in an external place, would there be some evidence of it or not? If there were no evidence of it there, that would be the same as if it did not exist. If there were evidence of it, then it would have no fixed location. Why? Suppose that someone were to indicate the middle by a marker. When regarded from the east, it would be to the west, and when regarded from the south, it would be to the north. The marker is unclear, and the mind would be equally chaotic. Ananda said, The middle I speak of is neither of those. As the world honored one has said, the eyes and forms are the conditions which create the eyes consciousness. The eyes make discriminations. Forms have no perception, but a consciousness is created between them. That is where my mind is. The Buddha said, if your mind were between the eye and an object, does the mind's substance combine with the two or does it not? If it didn't combine, if it did combine with the two, then objects and the mind substance would form a chaotic mixture. Since objects have no perception, why the substance has a perception? The two would stand in opposition, which is the middle. If it did not combine with the two, it would then be neither perceiver nor perceived and would have no substance or nature. Where would the characteristic of middle be? Therefore, you should know that for the mind to be in the middle is impossible. Ananda said to the Buddha, World honored one, when I have seen the Buddha turn the Dharma wheel in the past, with great Maudgadhyayana, Saputi, Purna, and Shariputra, four of the great disciples. He often said that the nature of the mind which perceives makes discriminations and is aware is located neither within nor outside nor in the middle. It is not located anywhere at all. That very non-attachment to anything is what is called the mind. Therefore, is my non-attachment my mind? The Buddha said to Ananda. You say that the nature of the mind which perceives makes discriminations and is aware is not located anywhere at all. The entirety of things existing in the world consists of space, the waters, the land, the creatures that fly and walk, and all external objects. Does your non-attachment also exist? If it does not exist, it is the same as hairs on a tortoise or horns on a rabbit. How can you speak of non-attachment? If non-attachment existed, it could not be said to be non-existent. To be non-existent is to be without attributes. To be existent is to have attributes. Whatever has attributes it has a location. How then can it be said to be unattached? Therefore, you should know. 
to call the aware knowing mind non-attachment to anything is impossible. Then Ananda arose from his seat in the midst of the great assembly, uncovered his right shoulder, placed his right knee on the ground, respectfully put his palms together and said to the Buddha, I am the Tathagata's youngest cousin. I have received the Buddha's compassionate love and have left the whole life, but I have been dependent on his affection and as a consequence have pursued erudition and am not yet without our flows. I could not overcome the Kapila mantra. I was spun around by it and sank in the house of prostitution all because I did not know the location of the realm of reality. I only hope that the world honored one, out of great kindness and pity, will instruct us in the path of Shamatha to guide the Enchantikas and overthrow the Mlekshas. After he had finished speaking, he placed his five limbs on the ground along with the entire great assembly. Then they stood on tiptoe waiting attentively and thirstily to respectfully hear the instructions. Then the world honored one radiated forth from his face various kinds of light, dazzling light as brilliant as hundreds of thousands of suns. The six kinds of Quaking pervaded the Buddha realms and thus lands, as many as find most of dust throughout the ten directions appeared simultaneously. The Buddha's awesome spirit caused all the realms to unite into a single realm. And in these realms, all the great bodhisattvas, each remaining in his own country, put their palms together and listened. The reason those who cultivate cannot accomplish unsurpassed body, but instead reach the level of a self hero or of one enlightened to conditions, or become accomplished in outside ways as heaven dwellers, or as demon kings, or as members of the retinue of demons, is that they do not know the two fundamental rules and are mistaken and confused in their cultivation. They are like one who cooks sand in the hope of creating savory delicacies. They may pass through as many ends as their most of dust, but in the end they will not obtain what they want. What are the two, Ananda? The first is the root of beginningless birth and death, which is the mind that says it upon conditions and that you and all living beings now make use of taking it to be the self-nature. The second is the primal pure substance of the beginningless body nirvana. It is the primal bright essence of consciousness that can bring forth all conditions because of conditions you consider it to be lost. Living beings lose sight of the original brightness, therefore, Though so they use it to the end of their days, they are unaware of it and without intending, so they enter the various destinies. Ananda, since you now wish to know about the path of Shamatha with the hope of getting out of birth and death, I will question you further. Then the Satakata raised his golden arm and bent his five wheeled fingers as he asked Ananda. Do you see? Ananda said, I see. The Buddha said, What do you see? Ananda said, I see the Satakata raise his arm and bend his fingers into a fist of light which dazzles, dazzles my mind and my eyes. The Buddha said, What do you see it with? Ananda said, The members of the Great Assembly and I each see it with our eyes. The Buddha said to Ananda, You have answered me by saying that the Sadhakata bends his fingers into a fist of light which dazzles your mind and eyes. Your eyes are able to see, but what is the mind that is dazzled by my fist? Ananda said, 
The Sadakata is asking where the mind is located. Now that I use my mind to search for it thoroughly, I propose that precisely what is able to investigate is my mind. The Buddha said, Hey, Ananda, that is not your mind. Startled, Ananda leapt from his seat, stood, and put his palms together and said to the Buddha, If it's not my mind, what is it? The Buddha said to Ananda, It is your perception of false appearances based on external objects, which deludes your true nature and has caused you from beginning this time to your present life. To recognize a thief as your son and lose your eternal source and to undergo the wheels turning. Ananda said to the Buddha, World honored one, I am the Buddha's favorite cousin. It is because my mind loved the Buddha that I was led to live the whole life. It is my mind that not only makes offerings to the Tathagata, but also in passing through lands in uh, as many as the grains of sand in the Ganges River to serve all Buddhas and good wise advisors and in marshalling great courage to practice every difficult aspect of the Dharma. I always use this mind, even if I am slandering the Dharma and eternally withdrawing my gurus, it would also be because of this mind. If this is not my mind, then I have no mind, and I am the same as a clot of earth or a piece of wood. Without this awareness and knowing, nothing would exist. Why does the Tathagata say this is not my mind? I am startled and frightened, and not one member of the Great Assembly is without doubt. I only hope that the World Honored One will regard us with great compassion and instruct those who have not yet awakened. Then the World Honored One gave instruction to Ananda and the Great Assembly, wishing to cause their minds to enter the state of patience with the non-production of dharmas. From the lion's seat, he wrapped Ananda's crown and said to him, The Tathagata has often said that all dharmas that arise are only manifestations of the mind, all causes and effects. The wounds as many as fine moles of dust come into being because of the mind. Ananda, when all the things in the world, including blades of grass and strands of silk thread, are examined that of their fundamental source, which is seen to have a substance and a nature. Even empty space has a name and an appearance. How much the less could the clear, wonderful, pure, bright mind, the essence of all thoughts itself, be without a substance? If you insist that the nature which knows and observes it, and is aware of distinctions is the mind. Then, apart from all forms, smells, tastes, and touches, apart from the workings of all the defiling objects, that mind should have its own complete nature. And yet now, as you listen to my drama, it is because of sound that you are able to make distinctions. Even if you could extinguish all seeing, hearing, awareness, and knowing, and maintain an inner composure, the shadows of your discrimination, discrimination of dharmas would remain. I do not ex insist that you grant that it is not the mind, but examine your mind in minute detail to see whether there is a discriminating nature apart from the objects of sense that would truly be your mind. If this discriminating nature has no substance apart from objects, then it is shadows of discriminations of objects of mind. The objects are not permanent, and when they pass out of existence, such a mind would be like hair on a tortoise or horns on a rabbit. In that case, the Dharma body would be extinguished along with it. Then who cultivates and attains patience with the non-production of dharmas? 
At that point, Ananda and everyone in the Great Assembly was speechless and at a total loss. The Buddha said to Ananda, There are cultivators in the world who, although they realize the nine successive stages of Samadhi, do not achieve the extinction of our flows or become our hearts, all because they are attached to birth and death, false thinking, and mistake it for what is truly real. That is why now, although you are greatly learned, you have not realized the accomplishment of sagehood. When Ananda heard that, he again wept sorrowfully, placed his five limbs on the ground, knelt on both knees, put his palms together, and said to the Buddha, Since I followed the Buddha and left home, what I have done is to rely on the Buddha's awesome spirit. I have often thought, there is no reason for me to toil at cultivation, expecting that the Shatakasa would bestow samadhi upon me. I never realized that he could not stand in for me in body and mind. Thus, I lost my original mind, and although my body has left the home life, my mind has not entered the way. I am like the poor son who renounced his father and roamed around. Therefore, today, I realize that although I am greatly learned, if I do not cultivate, it is the same as if I had not learned anything, just as someone who only speaks of food will never get full. World honored one, now we all are bound by two obstructions, and as a consequence, do not perceive the still eternal nature of the mind. I only hope the Tathagata will take pity on us poor and destitute ones and disclose the wonderful bright mind and open the way I. Then from the character one signifying my red virtues on his chest, the Tathagata poured forth the precious light, radiant with hundreds of thousands of colors, the brilliant light simultaneously pervaded everywhere throughout the ten directions to Buddha realms as many as the fine most of dust, anointing the crowds of every Tathagata in all the jeweled Buddha lands of the ten directions. Then it swept back to Ananda and all in the great assembly and said to Ananda, I will now erect the great Drama banner for you to cause all living beings in the ten directions to obtain the wondrous subtle secret, the pure nature, the bright mind, and to attain the pure eye.